You're now listening to Sound Talent Media. Check out more shows at SoundTalentMedia.com. Hey, what's up, everyone? I'm Matt Migaki, the vocalist of Cryptopsy and the host of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast, where I sit down with fellow metal musicians. We talk all about their lives and music while sharing killer craft beers. If you've ever wanted to sneak backstage and share a beer with one of your favorite musicians, well, Vox and Hops is the podcast for you. This week on the podcast, I dropped a killer episode with Johannes Ekström of Avatar. There is this episode and over 440 other ones to help you enjoy life, metal, and craft beer. So what are you waiting for? It's time to become a Vox and Hops head. Cheers! This episode of the Tone Mob Podcast is brought to you by Rattlesnake Cables. In my various cruisings of the internet, I had seen Rattlesnake Cables pictured alongside some pretty insane gear setups, like some, some wicked rigs. So when Hank from Rattlesnake hit me up about trying some cables, I was pretty excited, to say the least. But you know how that is. Sometimes things don't quite live up to the hype. This case, not one of those. These things are they are very well made. I've encountered a lot of cables in my time as a gearhead and guitar player, and these are these are some of the best. They are definitely crafted with attention to detail, and just the way they look and they feel, it's it's just kind of fun to, to open them up and plug your guitar. And it's like, all right, here it comes. It's time to rock. It's quite nice. I would highly recommend hitting up the show notes, heading over to rattlesnakecables.com, and grabbing yourself a cable or two. You will be very, very glad that you did. Right now. The future is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> with with, with Polly Shore oh, and no. everything. Uh, maybe it's not not <laughs> as amazing as I remember. Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's episode of the ToneMob.com podcast, the show about guitar tone and the people behind it. I'm Blake Wyland, and with me today I have Scott Marcourt of string joy custom strings how are you doing today hey blake how's it going buddy i'm doing all right just uh it's a cold monday in nashville so trying to stay warm it's pretty pretty chilly here today we actually had snow the last few days oh my well P- portland snow sounds weird. like a, a dream or something from a christmas card uh down here it's just like gray and bleak it's it's not portland snow is is a hard and icy and slushy <laughs> It's not like uh, it's not fluffy and nice like you would want it to be. Mm-hmm. It's like this gross ice solution that then, if it's going to snow, that means it's going to freeze. So then it just becomes everything becomes a skating rink. So, <laughs> well, I guess all the people from up there are so nice that it makes sense that the the snow would be the hard and icy thing out of all of it. Uh, yeah, and and it's just like, and then nobody knows how to deal with it. Like they're like, <laughs> oh, oh, I can't go anywhere. It's it's pretty pathetic, really. It's, Same. It's kind of sad. Same here. I, I'm I'm no expert, but I've drove to the mountain enough, and it's like just slow down. You guys will be fine. Just, <laughs> you'll be okay. Just go. Oh, I'm with you. It's all confidence, like in all things. Well, th- that's true. Like it's like in recording a podcast. If you don't, you know. Oh wait, never mind. We won't go there. <laughs> So, uh, other than the snow and the ice and all that good stuff and the cold, how how are things going for you today? Man, everything is uh, amazing. Everything's great with the company. We are we are crazy busy right now. Um, we had a like absolute gangbusters uh, holiday season from Thanksgiving straight through to Christmas, and then uh, you know I kind of thought maybe it'd die down a bit after Christmas, but it just keeps just keeps going man i guess everybody got a lot of guitars for uh for christmas and needs uh needs some custom string sets to get them all set up so uh we'll take it but yeah that's not a bad deal that's uh-huh. not a bad deal at all that's cool did were you doing like special black friday things that pushed that along or yeah, this... yeah 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 we, we that definitely was the start and we had a couple sales a, a funny story i so i've got a couple guys you know that are here that work specifically on putting together each set you know as as we say, like when you order your set, you uh, we make it after that. It's kind of made to order, so they're not just sitting around gathering dust or anything. But uh, those guys were all on vacation over Thanksgiving. I don't like to make people work, uh, you know, over the holidays. So I, I went ahead and set my butt down in the chair, and you know, I sent out an email saying, you know, we're open. I'm just taking orders all on my own. 
uh, you know, I think I know how to do this. And, uh, you know, it went absolutely berserk and it was only me to handle it. So I spent, just, you know, mm-hmm. like 22 hours a day uh, packing up the strings, you know, oh, like crazy. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Uh, so that was the kickoff to it. And it's just been, it's just kept going since then. I, I did eventually get some more help. The guys came back eventually. <laughs> That's a lot of strings. Yes, 22 yes, yes. hours a day packing strings. Oh, I mean, it was crazy. One I mean, guy. We, we, uh, we always send out a note with each of our orders. Um, and I, I let whoever, you know, whoever packs everything up sign it and say, you know, uh, rock on, you know, from Alex or John or whatever. Uh, and, mm-hmm. and all those that went out are from Scott. So I, I don't imagine there are many companies out there that you get a, a handwritten note that comes from the owner of the company when, <laughs> when you're ordering something on Black Friday. <laughs> Oh look, Ernie Ball sent me a note. Oh wait. yeah, exactly. <laughs> wait, he's dead. Oh no, this has got creepy. This real fast. is weird. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Well, man, if he's if Ernie Ball's available uh, to write notes, I wonder if I can like get him on the show somehow. Dude, I, I really... wish you the best. Who knows? You might, might have to <laughs> host a séance. I'm not totally sure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to comment too too far on that. <laughs> <laughs> we won't, we won't we won't go into that. I could get I could turn this into a totally different podcast. Oh yeah, but we we did uh we just launched a, a line of half gauge strings, which has been you know uh, going going nuts as well. Um, so to to I guess to to recap a little bit for anybody who doesn't know out there, uh, we're a custom yeah, guitar yeah, why don't string we, company. Uh, yeah, let's give them like the breakdown of what it is that you do yeah, before we totally. get off on too many tangents. Totally, totally. I sense uh, knowing you that that's a, that's a high possibility, the tangents. So we should open up with some some good pithy uh, discussion. Uh, but yeah, we're the world's you know only and first custom guitar string company. Uh, our big focus is letting players create their own sets, and we very often will create sets for people. So uh, for those of you out there that are thinking, you know, well, I... I play the same strings that I get off the rack uh, all the time, and I never had a problem. Uh, what do these guys do? Uh, the answer is a lot, you know, depending on what it is that you need. But uh, in most cases, we'll just try to balance out the set a little bit. So uh, a good example would be if you look at your typical light gauge string set, it goes from 10, 13, 17, 26, 36, 46, right? That's what most people are probably playing out there. Well. The truth is, you might have noticed that your B string has a lot less volume on it. If you ever play just a high chord in the top, you'll notice that. A lot of people complain about that. Well, the reason is a 13 isn't actually heavy enough. We just round up to that number. Um, But a 14 is a little bit too heavy. So we will now use a 13.5 to fill in that gap and balance it out really nicely. On the bottom end, the same thing. The, The 46 that you're using for your E string, it's pretty darn floppy if you ever play a low E riff. Uh, and that's because it doesn't have as much tension as you'll see on the other two wound strings in a set. So we use a 48 instead of a 46, and we end up with a set that's really balanced throughout. You know, you don't have any of these big gaps in volume or in tension, so it's very easy to play. I mean, and that's just one example. We do a lot of work with guys that play in alternate tunings or guys that just want uh, a heavier set. Another great example would be, uh, let's say you might like the skinny top, heavy bottom sort of sets, but you also like your light sets. You want something in between. Uh, we can do that. We have what we call a husky set that's right in between those two. Uh, truthfully, the possibilities are endless depending on who you are. Uh, but whatever it is that you can dream of, that's our job to, to get it done. You know? So we, we've kind of tried to take the, the custom approach that's so awesome to see in guitars and pedals and amps uh, and apply it to strings, which is something that you know, a lot of us take for granted. I, I did certainly for the first couple years I was playing. Uh, and really try to show people how much of a difference it can make on your tone and the playability of your guitar uh, when you can really mess with and customize your string set to fit your needs. So that's that's in a nutshell <laughs> what we're up to. <laughs> so the, it's kind of an interesting thing to think about when when we sit down and 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 talk about what you said about taking it for granted. Mm-hmm. It's it's really odd if you really think about what a guitar is, it's a stringed instrument. Mm-hmm. Yet one of the last things that we really talk about are the strings, which is actually what makes the sound. Yeah. So it's kind of, it's kind of ironic that everyone's pretty much guilty of it, uh, you know, to some degree mm-hmm. for at some point in your guitar playing career, you were like, yeah, these strings are fine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I, I mean, I was there myself. So, I mean, I don't, I don't hate anybody for, for feeling that way, but you know, the, the way I even got into messing with my strings is, 
you know, I was looking at my rig and saying, you know, I've got shoot like a dozen pedals. I've gone crazy to get just the right, you know, like really good so solid cables to connect them to make sure my signal's clean. I've modded my pickups, my guitar, my amp is like highly customized, and yet I'm still playing like the same, you know, like five dollar strings I get from Guitar Center that I know have been sitting there for like a year on the rack. And I was like, what the hell am I doing? Uh, right. It's kind of crazy. So uh, that was kind of the beginning for me. And you're exactly right. I mean, the strings are where the sound comes from. I mean, and, and so I get to people when I say this sometime and they'll say, oh, so I can play, you know, a certain set of strings and I'll sound like Jimi Hendrix. Well, no, I mean, <laughs> Jimi Hendrix sounds like <laughs> Jimi Hendrix because he's Jimi Hendrix. But your gear still always matters. And I think definitely uh, the Tone Mob guys understand that probably better than anybody. Uh, when you have really solid gear everywhere across your, your signal chain, you're going to end up um, with a great outputted sound. And the great thing about strings is they're the one modification that bridges the gap between something that changes how you play the guitar and something that changes how the guitar sounds. So if you're you know, messing with pedals or you know, different mods on the amp side, they're definitely going to change the guitar's sound, but the guitar is still going to feel the same, right? Uh, and by the same token, if you're you know straightening out your neck with a truss rod or doing some guitar mods, they're not going to do much of the sound, but they change your playability. With strings, it really can do both. You know, not only does it make it even to play across the fretboard with your fingers, which can make you know all sorts of a difference on the eventual tone, but it also will you know smooth out the tone or give you a little bit more heaviness on the bottom end, whatever it is. Uh, so I mean, when you look at it, you know, our, our sets are ten, start at ten dollars for a six string set, and you go up from there for seven and eight strings and bass strings as well. But when you look at the amount of change that you can get for 10 bucks, I mean, I've got so many customers that send me emails um, being like, you know, I just spent $400 on pedals <laughs> and I'm, <laughs> I'm happier with, you know, this, this tiny little $10 change I made, you know? So it's definitely something we all take for granted and, you know, we're all guilty of it. Uh, but it's certainly fun being out there, being the guy to uh, try and open people's eyes and show them, you know, that there's another option out there. Right, right. <clears throat> I mean, it's it's a uh, it's just strange. Like like I was saying before, I'm oh, I'm looking at a bunch of strings right now that are just like you say. There, I've been playing the same, basically the same sets of strings for not not the same set people. That, mm -hmm. I'm not that crazy, but the basically <laughs> the same the same sets of strings for you know over you know like. What, 12 years now right like basically and and it's just like i got i went you know i was playing light gauge strings and i started breaking them because i was a hardcore kid and beating my guitars and then yep. i uh it's like well i keep breaking strings better go up up a couple gauges mm -hmm. and that's where i've stood ever since and i have noticed the imbalance ever since i started getting really into tone and and gear i mm -hmm. like oh this is interesting I, this isn't quite you know, right? And I would try adjusting maybe pick up coil heights or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, the magnet heights on depending on the guitar. And um it just you know, it just makes sense that, oh, maybe these strings aren't exactly the you know, scientifically correct for what I'm trying to do. Totally, totally. Yeah. And I mean and and it's again, it's different for everybody. The the really cool thing that we try to do is uh it, it's something that it's not a one size fits all. It's you know, it's too involved you know when there's they're strings that you're really pushing around it's going to be a little different for everybody uh so you know we can do that we can make things different for each individual person um the other companies out there doing them and not to hate on those guys they i definitely played um a lot of their strings for a lot of years and they do some great work but they're ultimately finding a one-size-fits-all solution right um which will yeah it'll, it'll work for a lot of people but you know not for all sorts of discerning guitarists, you know, especially people that always really want to customize things. Um, so right. it, it's it's a whole different world for sure. Right. So let's let's do this. Mm -hmm. This would be interesting. I think we kind of touched on this briefly the other day off the air, but let's let's uh, dissect <clears throat> a set of strings here that I have, mm -hmm. and and we can go through, and you can kind of suggest the direction I should try to go. Absolutely. Um, and to try to even think, basically try to try to even things out, mm -hmm. you know. So here we go. I normally play uh, a set of 11 to 48. Mm -hmm. um, so that's 11, 14, 18 P, 28, 38, 48. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that for you. I'm saying that for No, anybody. totally cool. Because <laughs> I wouldn't know unless I was looking at the package right now, which I am. Mm -hmm. uh, so where, 
would you suggest to make tweaks to that general set to, to make improvements in balance? All right, so uh, just one question before I get going on all of it. Uh, what sort of scale length are you playing on? Are you on like a, the more like Gibson 24.75 or like the Fender uh, 25.5? Do, do you know offhand? Yes. Both. <laughs> okay, okay, cool. Well, I'll just... Uh, but no, most of the time I'm, I'm playing Gibsons most of the time, but... Um, Okay. Uh, I also have a, I also have a Rickenbacker, um, that's strung up a little bit heavier, but uh, cool. and that's a twenty. I can't remember what scale length that is now. That's yeah, definitely think, longer than Gibson. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I got I'll use the Gibson as an example. Um, but yeah, just to kind of throw out some numbers to people, it changes a little bit depending on the different scale lengths or tunings. But with that uh, set that you told me, the eleven, fourteen, eighteen, twenty-eight, thirty-eight, forty-eight. There's a couple yep, standard of standard tuning most yeah. of the time. There, there's a couple of big things that come up. So, like, the 11 is going to be putting out about 18 and a half pounds of pressure. The 14 is only going to be doing 16.8. So, like, almost two pounds less pressure on the B. And the G is going to be right in the middle, so 17.5. So, that's really wow. unbalanced. I mean, you've got, like, a ton of tension on the high E, not really very much at all on the B, and then kind of in the middle on the G, uh, which, if you really listen, you can usually hear that. Um, as well. And not only that, you can also feel it on the playing. So the biggest priority is to kind of round that out a bit. The B and the G aren't that far off. So one approach would be to just take the high E down to a 10 and a half. Uh, and that would balance everything out pretty well if you did 10 and a half, 14, 18. Uh, another option would be to say 11, keep that one on top, and then go with a 15 on the B string and a 19 on the G string which would pretty nicely balance everything out there. Uh, those are just two approaches, and it's kind of different if you're doing 10s. It's a different world as well. Um, but as you can see, there's a big imbalance there. A lot of guys will talk about uh, how much of a difference they can always hear on their B string or their G string, uh, or sort of intonation and tuning problems they have on those. And there's a number of things that go into that in terms of the, the reality of playing a fretted instrument. But the, one of the big differences is the string gauges just don't really balance very well. So I would say do one of those tweaks in the top end. And as far as the bottom goes, the 28 and 38 are really even. Those are both putting out just about 20 pounds of tension, whereas the 48 is only putting out 17.8 uh, pounds of tension. And that always happens when you see like 26, 36, 46, or 28, 38, 48. The mm -hmm. lowest gauge string, that, that 48, is not nearly enough to keep up with it. So in regular tuning, you'll, you'll feel that that one's a little bit floppier. If you go down to drop D, it's a monster. Um, I've got so many guys that play in drop D and are so used to playing you know, it on a standard set of strings. And you know, these guys are playing in it all the time. And it just it doesn't work at all. You can bend that, uh, that D string halfway around the neck of the guitar. It doesn't work. So uh, for you, I, I know that you're not doing all your playing in drop D. I would recommend just taking it up just a little bit, go to a 50 there, and that's going to mm -hmm. bring that right up to 20 pounds of tension, 28, 38, 50. If you were playing in drop D all the time, I would say maybe go with the 52 on the bottom end, but for what you're doing, that kind of gets you where it's really balanced and standard, and it'll help a little bit when you're going uh, all the way down to drop D as well. So to recap, I would say for you, either go 11, 15, 19, 28, 38, 50, or 10 and a half, 14, 18, 28, 38, 50. And mm -hmm. those numbers, I mean, to all the listeners out there, those can be totally different depending on who you are and what your aims are and uh, what you're trying to do. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. As you were talking about these uh, different tensions, I was, <laughs> um, I was feeling my Les Paul and just like just moving the strings a little bit. Mm -hmm. and, and it's like, oh, yeah, I can definitely tell that... Uh, that B string, seriously. That's oh yeah, a, that's way that's way different than that than that high E. That high E is way tighter. That's just so things you kind of subconsciously know, mm -hmm. but you don't really know exactly. <laughs> and and you know every guitar you've ever played on is like that. You know, so you get kind of used to it. I, I was just on a Reddit thread earlier today because I'm a geek uh, that was talking about you know how uh, so for some people it's the G and for some people it's the B are always going out of tune on their guitars, and there are a bunch of people providing answers, some of them good, some of them bad. Um, and the truth is, like, yes, guitar really did start with wound third strings. Um, that was mm -hmm. sort of the standard practice until blues guys started using plain strings so that they could bend to high hell, um, which is, you know, obviously has a lot of advantages. 
But the, a lot of the people were telling people, you know, you got to go to this wound third set. But they'd say, you know, ah, I, I can't stand it. And the reason is when you see wound third sets, in most cases, that wound third is balanced out um, with the other wound strings. Uh, whereas oh. if you balance it out with the plain strings, the same as, you know, I would when I just ran your tensions right there, you end up with a very playable wound third. Uh, so we do a lot of that, go like 10, 13, 18 wound, or 11, 14, or 11, 15, 20 wound. Um, and there were a ton of people commenting about the B string, and nobody really had a good example for why that was, so I, I went ahead and tried to help <laughs> educate right. people on all that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, a, a lot of these these sort of sets have been the same for you know many decades. I mean, they used to be different when, when Hendrix and Page played. They were a lot lighter sets on the bottom end. Um, but yeah, they, we've been kind of rolling with the same sort of tension profiles for a long time and, you know, nobody asks any questions about it and everyone just keeps going with it and it's what you're used to. But, you know, whenever you, uh, there, there's a great quote I like, uh, whenever you find yourself on the side of major the majority, it's time to pause and reflect. Uh, you know, so whenever you're looking at something and you say, well, we've always done it this way, uh, there's usually room for improvement there. So we've been able to find definitely you know a, a lot of room there, and that's been fun. Right, right. Yeah, that's all. That's all very interesting. I'm mm -hmm. looking at all my guitars right now, and then I'm just thinking about um, my last uh, my last little jam session I did with my band. We started playing some songs in tunings that I've never messed with before. Yep. Which specifically were like drop A and drop B, mm -hmm. and I'm playing this on. Uh, uh, on a, you know a, something that's set up to be playing in standard, and I'm just kind of remembering how it sounded cool uh, because it just sounded cool. But man, those that played like garbage when I had them. Tuned yeah, that floppy exactly. And not and not set up for it. And so, there there uh, truly aren't string sets out there. I mean, you know, with with us there are, but uh, otherwise there aren't string sets that are really made for alternate tunings. And I mean, I think it's obvious to any player. Um, when you look at, you know, you're taking a few of your uh, strings on the neck of your guitar and you're tuning them up a whole step or down a whole step and leaving the other ones the same, uh, that <laughs> obviously is not going to be good um, in terms of having an even tension, especially if you're keeping a guitar in that tuning all the time. Uh, so we can definitely help with that. I mean, we've got a bunch of guys that play in drop C, drop B, drop A. And a lot of them, what they do is they use like the, the skinny top heavy bottom set or like just a heavier set all around but the problem is like if you're you're taking all the wound strings and making those all much heavier but then you're taking that bottom string and taking it down another whole step you're still going to end up uh where it has way less tension than the other two strings you know the answer isn't necessarily right. to go heavier all around you just really need to get heavier on that bottom string and then kind of adjust a little bit to even it out so yeah there everyone's found these sort of solutions you know kind of on their own or like has you know different methods for trying to deal with them and aren't necessarily um, the right way. So we're, we're definitely, I'm spending a lot of time out there just trying to, uh, to educate people that there are other better ways to accomplish uh, those tunings in general. So it's, it's a wild world for sure. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Well, you clearly like you're rattling these numbers off like, like uh, no one's business. This is clearly oh, yeah. something that you've, uh, spent a lot of time you had to have spent a lot of time prior to the business mm -hmm. you know researching and doing that kind of stuff so let's do what i like to do mm -hmm. and let's take us uh, through your musical backstory yeah absolutely to, to where you know you eventually started the company and you're doing what you're doing today totally i, I never get to talk about that very much so I, i'm excited um i pl started playing guitar when i was in uh, fourth grade i'm not even sure how old i was back then um, I had like my, my trapper keeper, uh, had like, just like pictures of Jimmy Page and stuff all over it. Um, I, I was one of those kids. So, you know, I, I got into it and just fell in love, uh, and kept playing. I was a Les Paul guy forever. Um, got a big half stack that my band teacher gave me, um, that he found in a back room. And I just like shredded on that all through middle school. Um, I got really involved in the worship world in high school. I was, uh, the, uh, youth group, like worship leader when I was maybe 15 or 16, which was a crazy good experience. Cause I mean, our church had like a DW kit in like its own cage. And I had like orange and Vox amps in the back to use. And we were going through this really, really pro speaker system with in-ear monitors and everything. So 
I would say that experience like totally got me into wanting to get my tone just right because everything was done in such a pro level. I mean, even though I was a kid, uh, it was like, it was like touring, you know, with a big, big act where your tone really does matter. So I got into everything, you know, shaping my pedal board, modding my guitars, my amps, all that stuff. I mean, just anything I could to try to get uh, things sounding better. And I, I kind of stuck with that. I went to college. I'm from Indianapolis originally, and I came down here to Nashville, Tennessee, went to Vanderbilt, and uh, started a band with my roommate there called Osteria, which is now defunct, but uh, we ran that out for a couple of years, and uh, I played guitar in that as well. And just the whole time, man, I've like, I've been through probably hundreds of different pedals, you know, just swapping things out and trading them and messing with it. So I've been a geek forever. Um, and like I said, at a certain point, and I'm not sure when it was, um, a couple of years back, I just started you know, getting curious about strings as another angle of something to nerd out over um, and was mixing with some sets here and there. And, you know, it's pretty expensive to mix sets, but I did it anyway <laughs> uh, to try to get there. And I can't say, I mean, back then, I can't say I knew anything of what I was doing in terms of like, I wasn't looking up the tensions or anything. Um, I was just screwing around, really. <laughs> um, I really, my thing, like the first thing to me, I really like wound thirds. And I wanted a really light wound third, so I got a hold of an 18, uh, and I have been using that for a long time, so that I can bend it like a plain string, but it you know has the tuning properties and the stability of a wound string. So that was the, mm -hmm. the first big thing for me. Um, but I just kind of kept going on that train for a while, and at a certain point, I, I worked in the music industry. I was an associate artist manager here in town for a while, and I, I got out of that just because you know it's not it's not so much fun trying to make money by making people buy records anymore, uh, as you might have heard. They don't really like to I've... do that these days. <laughs> oh, no? No, that's no. not a thing anymore? No, nobody told me. Uh, I didn't catch up on that. So, uh, <laughs> at a certain point, you know, I, I got out of that and, you know, was trying to figure out what I should do. And then I thought, you know, I've got to do something in the guitar world. Like, that's what I love uh, and that's what I know about. Like, I've got to do something. Uh, and at first, I was actually, I wanted to do subscription guitar strings. Um, so I made like a page for all that and I went to some Reddit forums in different places and just asked people like, here's my idea. What do you think? Um, and overwhelmingly like people were like, that's a neat idea, but like, I don't, you know, it's not really it for me. Um, you know, but a couple people commented about, you know, the string sets, uh, which I thought was kind of weird, uh, cause I'd been doing that too. And I decided, you know, there's an angle that I haven't gone after. So we went that way. I at first was like, you know, there are a bunch of different winders that make guitar strings. And I, I went to everybody and got a bunch of different samples um, to see what was going on and what could be pushed and pulled uh, to get everything just right. And that was kind of a crazy process. But you know, long story short, uh, settled on working with a couple guys that I felt really brought something to the table on different elements to find like the strings that are string joy strings. Um, which a set of ours is not a set that you can get from anywhere else. I know there are some companies that are just kind of repackaging strings. So we, we have our own strings uh, and they are awesome. But uh, we made those and uh, I started getting some traction online. And like, man, it, at first it was just like this tiny little thing, you know, and that's all I kind of thought it really was going to be. Uh, and then, you know, it went from me selling, you know, a couple dozen sets of strings a month to hundreds to thousands. I mean, <laughs> it's been a wild ride. Uh, and I mean, this has all been in the course of, gosh, we started just at the end of 2014. So it's been fast. Uh, and, wow. Yeah, yeah. That was going to be my next question. When did you start doing that? Yeah. So I probably should awesome. have provided some dates along the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't get to tell the origin story too often uh, until they, they like call me up to give a TED talk or something. Um, right. <laughs> in front right. of an audience. <laughs> then I'll practice it. But uh, I'm still kind of rusty now. But yeah, that was the end of 2014. And I mean, I think November 2014 was the first month I was selling any. And I, I think I probably sold like, you know, 30 sets of strings, something like that. Um, and then it's just, you know, it, it doubled and then doubled again and doubled again, and doubled again. Uh, and it, it keeps going that way, man. It, it blows my mind. We're, we're still just selling uh, online direct to customer here in the States. We've got a couple places internationally that carry our stuff. Uh, in the store, it's just because it's easier. But um, we haven't even, you know, pushed through a bunch of different retail outlets as of yet. So that's certainly going to come. 
Um, you know, and it's just all these people just keep coming to the site <laughs> and, and checking us out, uh, which is super cool. And I mean, the most fun thing is that I get, I've gotten to interface with so many cool musicians, um, and been able to help them find a set that's just right for them. Um, to anybody out there, uh, this is kind of an aside, but I'm, I'm Scott S C O T T at stringjoy.com. That's my email address. Uh, everybody has it. You can email me about whatever. I don't care. Um, I try to be really <laughs> accessible to people. Uh, and that's the fun part with me. I mean, I, I, I got into the music business on the artist side just because I wanted to be close to music. Um, and I'll, to be honest, so much of that, I was, you know, crunching numbers and sending out mailing lists and all this stuff. You know, I felt really far away uh, from the actual music. And now with this, I mean, I get to be involved with musicians, careers and lives. And it's such a such a cool, you know, it's a dream come true for me, certainly. Uh, just to be able to be around so much talent and be able to help everyone out. Yeah, well, you know, you've sent your email address. People are going to be emailing you like, hey, Scott, I'm at the pizza place, and I don't really know what toppings to get. Could you oh, help dude, me out with that? You can, I can 100% do that. That was uh, <laughs> Zappos.com, you know, who sells shoes. Uh, when they first opened up, um, their like slogan was, you know, call us, we'll help with anything. So you could, mm-hmm. you could call Zappos. And not even talk about shoes. Just be like, hey, like I need a pizza delivered to here. And they would call the pizza guy and uh, <laughs> and find a way to get the pizza delivered to you. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm that way. I, I don't want a million, you know, like, Scott, I, I have to break up with my girlfriend. What should I do? Or, Scott, I'm, I'm losing my hair. What can I, you know, <laughs> what, what sort of hats do you like? I mean, I can help with that, but I, I don't have a ton of time. But, you know, let, let's let's roll. It's fine with me. Email me about whatever. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we, you know, we, it's it's like I it's like I I try to do the same thing. You know, if you got any questions, you know, mm-hmm. don't feel free to email me, and I'll you know we'll figure it out. My my thing is because I I'm I'm not the smartest at uh, at at everything. So my thing is if I don't know, I can probably find somebody who does. Yep. And so that's that's my uh, my big uh, push. Yes, so, that is yeah, the way to be. If you guys want to talk to me about pizza too, you can email me. The only I thing I, I will say, uh, and I'm gonna actually take you up on that pizza offering. Uh, there's probably okay. there's got to be some like Portland stuff that I've never heard of before. So we'll talk about that after the show. Um, but I will say, and I know you know what I'm coming from. The only thing, just you know, out of love, please don't email me and ask me for a bunch of free stuff. I just I can't. Uh, I wish I could. Um, I know you <laughs> oh, know no. where I'm coming from. Oh I mean, no, we I'll, don't I'll, need to talk I'll, about I'll this say, again. No, 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 no. It's not a gripe. <laughs> I totally get it. The only thing I'll say is like a lot of the other guys, the string companies, they they will give out their strings all the time, and that's because those strings cost you know pennies to make. Basically, um, it's a, it's all a mechanized process. There's no humans involved. It's it's really cheap, so they don't care, you know. But but for us, the one thing you should know, uh, there are there are humans involved at every step of the way. Um, the strings are hand wound. When they come to us, they're hand packaged here in Nashville, sent out to you. So it, it's a really you know intensive process on that side, and the strings are really good too. Which uh, which so it, it ends up the point being, it costs quite a bit to to make the strings, and that's fine with us. But uh, just know that it's not uh, you're not getting like three cent strings for for ten dollars, you know, in order to get a big markup for everybody else. So right, that's that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there you go, there you have it. Um, but the Tone Mob guys are gonna... awesome, so I, I don't worry about that. You guys are like the dream uh, the dream audience to talk to, uh, just because everyone's really really knowledgeable and knows what they're doing. So um, that's always nice. These guys already know my opinions on. On free BC, so I'm not gonna get into that again. <laughs> That's fine with we, me. That's fine with we me. We won't. We won't bring that up again. That I just makes, makes me feel like the old curmudgeon, you know. It's like, ah, darn kids. <laughs> These dang kids. They don't want to work for nothing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. If anyone does it, you, I, I have a blog post you can forward them to, and, and okay, and then you won't feel bad about it because it'll be me yelling and not you. Can do. I like that. I like that plan quite a bit. Yeah, go ahead. It's that's why that's actually honestly kind of part of the reason I wrote it. So, mm-hmm. uh, people, you can find that uh, at tonemob.com. If you have to ask, that is what it is. Tonemob.com slash if you have to ask. That's where you can find that. Uh, my opinions on freebie seekers. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh man, you want to talk about an old man yelling? That's what that is, pretty much. Oh yeah, I understand. It's okay. You, you know, such is the industry. 
Um, but it's all right. It's a uh, it, it it pays off on the other side because guitar world is such a cool um, world to be in all around. It's yeah, it's true. I gotta. My wife tells me that I'm a, I'm an old man in a young man's body sometimes, and I I kind of <laughs> sometimes I feel that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I gotta rein in my grouchiness. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, I understand. Uh, anyway, but yeah, I agree that um, I've also said that a million times. This industry is uh, fantastic, and the deeper I dive into it, the more I'm enjoying it because of all the cool people. So, oh yeah, totally. I mean, like I my my girlfriend of many years, her her father is a great dude, but he uh, he works for a soap company. Well, they make a bunch of stuff, uh, different chemicals, but it's a lot of soap. So like he gets all this, you know. All this soap stuff, uh, and I'm sure it's like really fun to try out a bunch of different soaps and be like, I really like that soap. Um, but it's so much cooler being on the guitar side, and it's not that I get free <laughs> stuff all the time. I, I don't really ever. But uh, you know, I get to try out stuff from my competitors to check it out, and it's awesome. It's really cool. Like I love. Uh, I just got uh, Cusack Music's uh, Tap a Whirl. Um, or not the Tap a Whirl. I'm sorry, the Tap a Delay, um, which is mm. just this crazy, like heavily modulated. Um, delay pedal that I grabbed and it's just been like you know changing my world it's amazing <laughs> but oh man the Q- the Cusack stuff's pretty amazing oh uh, yeah I- I've been trying to get a hold of those guys forever if you're out there uh, shoot me an email um, but they haven't they haven't said anything back but I don't care because they do great work so it's fine okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now there um, I know just from 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 knowing uh uh, and hearing a few stories here and there, they are like ridiculously swamped right now. So, oh, I can only I, imagine. And I mean, the, the funniest thing about the guitar little universe is, uh, it, it's it's all these little shops that really are just kind of they're like. I mean, it's the same with us. Um, there's a number of people that work there, but it usually comes down to like one guy's personality um, is that way, uh, and kind of defines the whole company. Uh, so every every different company has these like eccentricities uh you know about them uh, which i think is actually really fun and cool um there's a lot of personality to the companies on the on the smaller side you know with all the pedal makers and the guitar makers and, and us as well uh, which is definitely fun i think it is and it's well it's one of those things that the uh, not and it, not exclusive to the guitar industry at all this right. is kind of getting a little bit into marketing nerd speak but mm-hmm. people don't really want to buy from faceless whatever's anymore for the most part. Right. I mean like they don't want to. They they will, but people mm-hmm. want to buy from other people. So you know, letting those little uh little quirks through in and every everybody in this industry has something. I I've, I've got too many. But um <laughs> it, it's a it's what that's what people like. I mean, that's oh, what yeah. I like. I like to know that I like to know that when I buy this pedal that that's going in that guy's pocket. Yeah, like, totally. Uh, you know, or what, or whatever piece of equipment it it may be. And it's funny not to you know not to hate on the big guys. Well, maybe that is. That's fine. Um, but uh, it's funny when you see like the CEOs of you know some of the bigger companies in in the industry who I won't name names or anything. Uh, really like doing their best to like make it seem like it's like a small little shop and they're they're you know hand making this for you and it's like that's being made in Indonesia <laughs> and being <laughs> right. shipped over here and you haven't touched a guitar in any way. um so not to sp- speak of anyone specifically there are a lot of awesome guys that run those companies but uh you know it, it's funny to see um those big companies that for so many decades uh all they had to do was pour millions of dollars into marketing budgets to sell their their stuff and then make it for cheaper and cheaper um having to kind of try to keep pace with all of us little guys out there who are uh, just trying to do, you know, an authentic job at, at selling, you know, cool stuff that'll help people. Right. Right. Well, it's the whole industry's changed and everybody knows that it's, yep. that's not news to anybody. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of a, it almost, it almost makes you like, I wouldn't want to be the head of a marketing department at a large corporation right now. Oh no, no, like, no, 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 no. Like it would be like, oh boy, like we can't move fast enough. You yeah. know what I mean to to keep pace with uh, the uh, yeah. Because whenever internet, you come up basically. with something, you have to be like, oh, we have to get it approved by this guy and this guy and this guy. You know, and, and in most cases, I mean, you you kind of just can't do what we do. You know, where like every time somebody will email me, I'll I can come up with 
um, you know, a different set for them that, that, that works for them for different reasons. Uh, and you, you can't do that when you're a big company because you have to have like sort of a customer service script, you know, where you call in and they say this. And so you respond with, well, Mr. Jones, in that case, I think blank, blank, blank. <laughs> uh, and it's, it's just not the same as being able to, you know, get the, get the owner of the, the shop on, on email and, and let him tell you what to do. Uh, you know, so that's, that's pretty neat. Yeah. I think, I think it's awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, which, which kind of brought me back to a thought I had earlier and I forgot mm-hmm. it. Um, when you were talking about, um, you're not, you're, all your stuff is direct sale right now. Right. And, um, which is awesome. Um, but getting into retailers, doing what, what you guys do, that seems like it would be difficult. Um, not, not in the, you know, because of the quality of the product or anything like that, but more like because of the custom nature of what you do. Yep. How, if you were to try to go into a retailer, like what would a set look like? Would it be, I mean, if say you were going to compete with the uh, 11 to 48s, like you, yeah, totally. you would just uh, tweak a set kind of like what you told me about, or how, how would you go about doing that if you were going to be in a retail store? Well, you know, that's, a, that's an excellent question and one that I wish I had like a, a guaranteed solid answer for, but uh, that's actually what I'm looking to kind of test out here in the next couple months, because there's kind of two schools of thought, like Either I could just make the same sets that everyone does with our strings uh, and try to go to retail and be like, you know, hey, here's a new um, name brand of strings that are, you know, handcrafted and hand put together um, and try to just get people on that angle. Uh, And that could work fine. I mean, I'm sure there are certain people that that's all they want is the same 10 to 46 set. Um, And the other option, which I find a little bit more exciting, uh, is to just kind of go into the stores bringing in totally different stuff, you know. Um, bringing in like truly balanced sets of strings. So like a 10, 13 and a half, 17, 26, 36, 48, um, or the 11 set that I made up for you uh, and try to bring in something totally different or, you know, really push like our nine and a half or our 10 and a half uh, as another option for people that want to go like a little bit heavier or a little bit lighter and haven't had the chance to. Um, so I think we're going to try and, I mean, when when the debate for me is, do I want to be like a normal company or do I want to be the weird company? Um, the answer is usually like I want to be the weird company, right? So <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, so you know, I I think we're gonna try and go that angle. I mean, I've always loved. Um, I think one of the first pedal companies that I got into, you know, forever ago was uh, was Zvex. Um, oh right. Who you know they've been making crazy stuff for ages, you know. Uh, and now they've got a lot of peers in that world, but it seemed like when I first found out about them, there weren't too many people doing what they were doing. Um, and I've always loved that, you know, they early on just did not give a damn, you know, they're like, we're going to make a $300 ring mod pedal that has, you know, a number of different ring mods that you can cycle through, uh, you know, or they'll make like the, the super hard on is like an overdrive that can just destroy your amp if you don't use it right, <laughs> uh, which is ridiculous. Like that's... You know that would—that's the worst idea to ever <laughs> go to market with. You know, on a in a plain business sense. Um, you know, right. even a, a lawyer would read that and be like, "Oh my God, no!" Uh, <laughs> but but they did. You know, they they made that work, and it's so much cooler and more fun as a result. Uh, so I think we'll definitely, as much as we can, try and be that company. Um, the only thing that's you know, it's all on me, of course, is to try and be the, you know, try and sell a bunch of shop owners on why they should carry, you know, a bunch of sets of strings that they've never seen before, um, you know, that are a totally different number. Now it's helped that we've got like, we've had customers asking shop owners. I've had, you know, shop owners email me and be like, Hey, I've got guys that (laughs) keep beating down my door to get these strings. Um, you know, how can I get them? So there's, there's some, it's some helpful things there in terms of demand. But uh, I've got to figure that all out, too. You know, whenever you're kind of the first to try and, you know, make something different in that way, it definitely has uh, its downfalls in terms of just convincing people. Um, A friend of mine, his name's Linus. He runs Yazoo Brewing Company here in Nashville, which is um, a big, big time spot down here. Uh, And he was the guy who had to go around to all the bars and convince all the bars that have Uh. four tap handles that they should take off Coors Light and put on, you know, an IPA. Uh, and that was not easy. <laughs> and, no. uh, you know, and everybody since him has, you know, been able to just walk up and say, hey, I've got a new local IPA, you know, and they'll say, oh, great, well, that'll sell. 
Um, so we'll yeah. put it right on. <laughs> but, you know, at, at the beginning, you know, the, nobody wanted to do that, right? So that was a challenge for him. And, you know, it, it'll be the same for me, I suppose. Uh, and, you know, like, the truth is, if if we're really successful and manage to um, really uh, show how important custom strings can be and convert a bunch of people, I'm sure the next thing you'll see is the big string company saying, oh, we're we're a custom string company too. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> right. You know, which, well, of which course. They've, they've already done, and that's fine. I mean, even um, one of the big companies, I don't like to name names, just out of habit, but um, I went to their, their site months ago, actually, and like the whole splash page was like, find your custom set of, str- you know, blank strings. Uh, and I was like, oh, God, no, no, this is horrible. Uh, and I, <laughs> I clicked through, uh, and, you know, it was exactly as I should have expected. It was just, they had an option that you could go to Amazon and buy each of their strings separately from Amazon for, like, a huge markup, you know, and it would be, like, $18 uh. for, a, for six strings. Um you know, and those strings are all individually packaged and come from totally different grosses and, you know, have been sitting on shelves forever. So I was like, yes, thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and the truth is, man, I mean, on all that, like, I think a lot of those companies, and I can't speak for them entirely, but, you know, they're making plenty of money just having strings that come, you know, from their factories and go out for sale. Um, and no fault to them. I mean, they're making good stuff. Um, but they don't, want to have to hire a bunch of people i don't think to put in you know it's a very labor intensive process on our side um getting these strings designed for people and getting them um set up and sent out so uh you know as a company if you're willing to put in the go with the extra mile for the customer uh it, it helps certainly because a lot of places you know don't want to have to put in that much effort right yeah you know. for sure let's see i i i i Hmm. I'm I'm going through my list here. Oh, you're fine. Uh, I got the list, and sometimes I don't look at it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I understand. Uh, sometimes we end up talking about nachos or something. But um, what I'm thinking about now is you mentioned you had uh, probably hundreds of pedals over the years, oh, which yes. I can re- I can relate to. Um, so I should ask, what does your current rig look like these days if you do get the chance to go out and play? Like, I know running a business is a little bit difficult to balance both of those things, but um, oh, totally. what's your rig look like? Well, I can tell you, like, I haven't been able to go out and play with my rig in a little while. I, I've sat in for a, a couple friends' um, shows just on a, an encore or something and used their rigs. So, you know, it's been a while since I've had to haul it out. It's kind of a mess of cables right now. Uh, but right now, I've got, like, I've had the same Fender tuner forever. I need to get a better one, but I haven't. Um, I go to the TC Electronic Hall of Fame reverb. Um, mm-hmm. That's at the front of my chain because I do a lot of, I love like shoegazy stuff, just huge atmospheric stuff. After that, I go to a ZBEX Fuzz Factory, which is, yeah. <laughs> if you've ever played one, <laughs> that is the recipe for, you know, destruction and disaster in the best way. <laughs> oh, <laughs> totally. yeah. Totally. I'm looking, I'm looking at one right now. Oh, right on. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> I got one of like the really, er- like the first like Vexter series, the like brushed metal ones uh, i have one of those when they first came out with them because i was poor and i was like oh my gosh i can afford one finally that isn't hand painted um, right so from that i go into the pigtronics philosopher's tone which is uh, i'm really mm-hmm. big into compression i did a lot of studio recording work when i was in college and kind of before and after a little bit too uh so like you know when you're when you're recording, it's all compression and EQ and a little and some reverb too. Uh, and on guitar, you don't usually use a lot of players don't use compression, and it can make a world of difference. So that thing's awesome. I can play a chord and it will sing out for like 18 seconds. Um, and then I've got the usual um, full tone overdrive. Like you can't you can't go wrong um, with anything that those guys are doing at all. Right. You got the the OCD. Yeah. 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 Yeah, um, yeah, and I course. used to have um oh the full drive. I have a full drive sitting around here somewhere too. Um right now it's the OCD up there, but I I like both. I don't know. Um after that, I go to what's the official name? The Roto Vibe from Jim Dunlop. Um, oh, okay. The like red pedals. I always think that like horrible Mark Wahlberg movie Rockstar. Um like <laughs> I, I remember watching Zach Wilde's like playing guitar in his band, if I remember right. And like he was always stomping at on that thing for solos and 
I'm not really sure why. It never sounded like there was like a roto vibe on the solo, <laughs> but it looked really cool, you know, for the movie. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then from there, I go to that Cusack Tapa delay I was talking about, which you know mm-hmm. is amazing. Uh, and then after that, I've got a Holy Grail as well. Um, yeah, I've got another reverb too. I I, I like reverb a lot. <laughs> uh, I like to, and so after that is the DL4. Uh, and I should say like, I, I really like to have, it's kind of always been my thing, but then Tim and Paula has been doing it too. I know he didn't get it from me, but I thought it was my thing first, but to use the reverb and then either modulate or delay the reverb signal, um, which gives you, it's, it's not what you're supposed to do, but it gives you a really no, it's cool, not. uh, <laughs> sort of uh atmosphere uh and i've got it all powered by the walrus audio i've never known how to say it it's like the atos or etos um power supply which is pretty sweet. oh right right and then yeah. next next to that i've got a like a uh just a pile of other pedals <laughs> which are mostly like <laughs> fuzz like wah, wah pedals fuzz pedals you know all that stuff mm-hmm. that i don't mm-hmm. always have on but uh i it no offense to anybody, but like with the roto vibe and a wah pedal, uh, going out to a gig, I always felt like kind of a tool. <laughs> Just <laughs> having like all these these you know stomp pedals that I was uh, messing around with. So I usually can only get away with one of those at a time. <laughs> I know I shouldn't care, but I do. Uh, and some part of me, I always like am worried. Some guys. You know, w- when I did play, it was a lot of like shoegazy stuff and, you know, a lot of pretentious stuff, uh, definitely from the fans, too. So I just never wanted to like play and get all these weird eyes from people. You know, if my board was all just like a bunch of metal zones and wah pedals and stuff, like they kind of look at you <laughs> like that. <laughs> you know, I, I should mention this is a little off topic, but um, there was this meme that went around on Christmas. I think I saw when Wampler shared it. But I'm sure they didn't create it. Maybe they did. But it was a picture of a guy unboxing, like, the, the hand-wired tube screamer box. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then he gets to the inside, and it's like a Metal Zone pedal. <laughs> just right. sitting in there. His, his face is just dejected. Yeah. Like, uh, come yeah, on. Yeah, that was, like, my favorite thing that I saw all Christmas season. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I loved that. I I I don't know that they made it. They have a Facebook group. Um, I I think that somebody in there may have created that. I'm not sure, but either way, yeah, that was quite funny. Yeah. Like, oh, sweet, sweet. I got this nice TS 808. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I I have to admit, man, I I've never tried with the hand wired ones, but. Um, I, I had an 808 for a long time. Um, well, the TS-808, I actually also had an 808 drum machine for a spell too. But uh, oh. <laughs> those are very different things. But uh, I had it and I loved it. And this is when I was really young, like maybe 15. Uh, and then I didn't for forever and I got into the full tone stuff. Like the full drive was the first pedal to make me be like, oh God, that's what a guitar can sound like. Uh, and I went back to, like I found a TS-9 a couple of years ago and I got it on a trade in Craigslist. And it just sounded like a blanket, like if I just plugged my guitar into a big like quilt, you know, and then plugged <laughs> that into the amp. I just did, I didn't like it at all, I have to admit. I mean, the, the, no offense to anybody. They can all obviously be used really well, but for me, it didn't, I didn't dig it again anymore. Well, you need two of them, like Stevie Ray Vaughan. Well, that's the trick. Hey, I, uh. <laughs> I want to ask you, because uh, I haven't gotten a chance to geek out about pedals in a while, because everyone always okay. comes to talk to me about strings. Um, right. But I don't know if you're at all... Maybe you're the type, okay, there are two types of people I know, and I know a bunch of musicians here in Nashville. There are those guitarists that every piece of gear they buy, they keep, even if they don't use it. They just have like a shell, they have every old amp, guitar, and pedal that they've ever had. Um, my my dear friend, Mason Hickman, he plays with the Dia Victoria, who just got signed to Atlantic and is about to be this huge thing. Um, he's one of those guys. He's got everything. I have never had enough money to do that, so I have like, have traded stuff, you know, religiously, just like tra- done even trades all over. So I've got a bunch of gear that I have had and I no longer have, and I just like pine for it all the time, you know. I'm like, I wish mm-hmm. I had that again. Uh, <laughs> and I have many, many stories I could share, but I'm curious, which of those two people are you? And if you are the second kind, is there are there any like pedal that got away, or you know, guitar or amps that got away stories? So I am definitely the first type okay. by 
Uh, and and everybody knows that. Uh, but yes, I I don't believe <clears throat> in selling anything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I had a feeling you were that, but I wasn't sure if there were like you know private examples that you had not shared uh, of you know the one thing you had to sell because you were really hard up for college money or something. Uh, um, I wasn't well, sure. that's that's the thing is when I was really hard up, I I couldn't afford to buy anything. Mm-hmm. So. So I didn't, I mean, I had a couple things I could sell, but when I was hard up for cash, I didn't really have anything worth selling. Like, like I could have sold, I could have sold, I guess my first electric guitar, my mm-hmm. Les Paul special, but then I would have been guitarless. And that was like, kind of okay. not really, not really in an option. So, I mean, yeah, I, I definitely have been uh, in dire straits for cash uh, at, at points in my life, but at those points in my life, I didn't have anything to sell, so I didn't really. <laughs> have well, that certainly it, helps, know? I suppose. <laughs> so I've been been fortunate that uh, ever since I be became a gearhead, that I haven't um, had a dire situation like that, and I hope that doesn't ever happen. But yeah, I don't. I don't believe in. Uh, I don't believe in selling gear because it. Every time I, I have done it, that, that mm-hmm. I shouldn't say that I haven't. I I have talked about this before. I sold this weird old Japanese electric. Mm-hmm. Um. And I regret it constantly. Okay. Um, I, I I sold it. To, I actually traded it, partial trade, to get a, a vintage Melody Maker, which I still have, mm-hmm. and I like that guitar too. And now um, I I'm just like I should have just waited a few more weeks, saved up the t- extra two hundred dollars, and bought it. And now because now I can't get that, I can't find that that guitar anywhere. No, you never can. Uh... I, I should qualify. So now that I've been listening to you talk, I realize that it's not. Ex- I misrepresented slightly. Um, so like the stuff that I've like really like loved and saved up to buy, I still have like everything in band. What would happen a lot in college is I would like hunt for stuff on Craigslist. I would find a great deal, like a super great deal on something, like something that was selling for half of what it should, and I would like find the money to buy it. Uh, and then I would tell myself like, I'm going to just hang on to this and like, be like, I got a sweet deal. But eventually I would just like, I'd sell it after like a month, you know, cause I, I never really had the, the money to begin with, <laughs> if that makes sense. And I like knew that I could make a profit on it. So like the best example, um, there was this Roland, uh, TS 909, uh, like the, one of the original drum machines, uh, they're super hard to find. They never made very many of them in the first place. And I saw one at a like flea market in rural Tennessee for 500 bucks. And I like tried to get the money myself and I didn't have any. So I borrowed it from uh, my roommate, the same Mason guy, actually, that I was just talking about. And I told him like, I tell you what, like we'll have this and we can play with it. But like, if we sell it, we can, I'll just split the profit with you. So we bought it for 500 bucks, uh, loved it and played with it for a while. And then just like both of us couldn't, you know, we both needed money, so I sold, mm-hmm, I sold it right. for fifteen hundred cash, like a couple weeks later, uh, and made a grand off the thing. Um, well, so that's hard to argue. That is hard to argue. Is tough, and I've had that happen a few times with different things. So I don't know. I just I I, I paid for college myself, and I went to a pricey school. Uh, so I found myself in that position more often than I would like to admit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you know, as much as I like to say I don't like to sell gear, there is a point where if you don't eat any food, you're not going to have the uh, physical ability to play with the gear. So I guess it doesn't really yeah, matter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like if you're all uh, dehydrated and, and and malnourished, you're not going to really be feeling like rocking out anyway. So uh, go ahead and, and you can... That in that case, I'll I'll condone the sale of gear. I okay, guess. I'm glad you come around. That, that makes, <laughs> makes all the difference to me. I was feeling. I'm sure it does. I was feeling shameful, man. It's it's tough, you know. Yeah, I'm I'm glad my approval means so much. <laughs> <laughs> it does. There's this it does. guy on the internet, and he didn't approve of me selling my gear when I needed to pay bills. <laughs> he says that's lame, dude. You know, there have been some tough times, like when I like first started. So I like really truly started uh, String Joy with about five hundred bucks, um, a little bit more. Like I, I coded everything. I still like all of our site, and like I'm I'm super proud of our our website. I think it looks better than like almost anything in the guitar industry. But um, I coded it all myself. Uh, wow! So I, I did everything like everything very 
what's the the proper term? Um, like I, I use my bootstraps, right? Uh, right. But man, there were like some dark times, uh, <laughs> you know, after that, because uh, that was like all the money that I had that just went to buy like you know a few of each you know string gauge that I needed, um, and so it was tough. And like after that, I I so nearly like just sold all my gear, you know, just to like get a couple grand to float me. Uh, but I didn't. Right. I didn't sell anything, and I've been very glad that I didn't. But man, it, it's it's hard. I mean, when you're like in debt or like don't have, you know, any money, and I'm sure a lot of people out there have been in that boat before. And you're sitting on you know a few thousand dollars of gear that you've accumulated your whole life. Uh, yes, it can be tough. Though I will say the only like good thing, you know, when I was young and I was like working in restaurants all the time and spending all my money on gear. And, you know, my parents were always very supportive, but I'm sure in a certain way they were like, stop, <laughs> stop spending all your money on guitar crap. Uh, uh-huh. But the beautiful, th- I've been so thankful that that's what I spent it on because it retains its value. You know, if I had like spent it on clothes or something, I would never see those things again. But, you know, I bought guitar gear and like it's still, I still have it and it still is worth like as much or like more than it was back then. So like kids out there. Uh, if your parents are giving you a hard time about wasting money on gear, don't listen to them. <laughs> <laughs> keep, keep on buying the gear. You'll be thankful. And if you get to college and you really need a couple hundred bucks, you'll be glad that it, you have it available to you. <laughs> because there's other gear addicts like me that go, I got to have it. Give it to yeah. me. I need it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. That is, that is kind of interesting isn't it? Like I've talked about that with the uh, guys before and uh, actually a guy, one of the guys that works at a guitar shop here in Portland, mm-hmm. um, he was just like, you know, I've worked in the, uh, he's been, you know, he's worked in guitar shops is pretty much his whole life. And, and he was like, you know, um, other than 2008, uh, yeah, I've not really, he's like, I've really not seen gear drop in value. And you know, that barely counts because everything dropped in value. It didn't matter what it was. So, uh, that's kind of an interesting point that you bring up. Yeah, gear, I mean, don't get me wrong. Your, you know, your pedal, your brand new boutique pedal you bought yesterday, tomorrow isn't going to be worth no, as much. Of course but, not, it, but, but it doesn't drop that much. No, no. And I always, I buy, like, I at least would always used to buy things used if I could at all possibly. Um, and then oh, it's yeah. like the same price, you know, which now I feel worse about because I know, like, you know, the guys that are making them and I want to, like, you know, help them out. Um, and and buy their products new because they're not making anything if they're just if I'm getting it used. But you know that's it's beautiful when you can you know especially if you get it on a deal and you're like shoot this pedal's already worth more than I bought it for you know in right. ten years from now and, and that's a wild thing like I I've had pedals that I've held on to for a few years and then flipped for something else and at the end of all that and I know you have listeners that are like I can't believe this asshole who's just selling all of his pedals but uh, <laughs> at the end of that I'm like man I got paid $50 you know basically cuz I sold it for more than I bought it for in order to play this pedal for 2 years like what a deal that's the sweetest right. deal that it, it, that comes right like that's the way to do it that is uh that's tough to argue with mm-hmm. it, it it really is i i definitely have i'm i'm sitting here looking at the pedal cabinet right now going, oh don't don't get into that don't get into that my brother oh no i'm Stay not away. gonna i ain't no no they're not gonna go anywhere okay, okay. You had me worried. <laughs> that's silly that's silly that <laughs> no. like, i thought you're gonna be like I, i'm looking over here and man i see a trip to tahiti over there i'm gonna i'm gonna do it <laughs> no i'd rather have pedals than go okay to good tahiti. <laughs> I won't. I won't. I, I was gonna say I won't tell the wife, but I'm sure she probably knows by now. Yeah, she does know. She does know. She's like, "Hey, we could go here." I'm like, "Yeah, but uh, Daddy needs a new amplifier." Yeah, so, uh, exactly. Uh, 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 no, uh, I'm not quite that bad, but yeah, I am. I am kind of. I um, sir, normal vacations, um, quote unquote, don't really appeal to me that much. If that mm-hmm. makes any sense, like I. Don't get me wrong. I went to Mexico and you know for my honeymoon and whatever. That's that's good times. Like hanging out in the tropical thing is is fun. Mm-hmm. But there's other. I I would rather do other things. Like I'd rather go to weird places. I guess. Oh yeah. I mean I I don't know if that that makes any sense. No, a hundred percent. I mean I'm I I like a good beach when I can. But like you know I I rarely get time to step away. But 
uh, you know, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm going to be at NAM here in a couple weeks and I'm excited to like go to, you know, LA is hardly for me at least like what sounds like an ideal vacation spot. Um, what was right. the, the busyness and the traffic and the smog, uh, but it'll be an adventure and a new, you know, a new world to see out there. So I, I'm, I'm stoked. So I, I get where you're coming from. It's, it's about the adventure, uh, and the, the education of it more than just relaxing with a Mai Tai. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, don't, I, there's a time for that. I, oh, I can, oh, I'm not putting that down, but yeah, I'm super, I'll see you down there. I'm super excited for Nam. That's just oh, in yeah. a few weeks now. Actually, by the time people hear this, it'll be really coming up. Yeah. So. Yeah. I know. I know. I know. Uh, if anybody is there, by the way, um, shoot me an email to link up. We're not doing a big booth or anything, but I'm going to be there, uh, just kind of hanging out and uh, having the time of my life. So uh, if you want to meet up, just blast me an email. Oh, there you go. Uh, that was Scott at stringjoy.com. Yes, everybody. that's correct. Yeah, I'm gonna. Mm-hmm. I, I'm hoping to like wake up tomorrow with a lot of invitations to parties. Uh, so you know, throw those my <laughs> way. Uh, I don't plan on sleeping at all. So, <laughs> well, all right, good time. <laughs> Good time. I'm not really sure what to expect. I keep telling everybody that I'm going to be the short guy wandering around drooling because I don't know what's going on. Oh, I know, right? Uh, Yeah, I I think I'm just going to have like, you know, I thought about like bringing a giant backpack full of like strings, but like, uh, you know, as you know, like our thing is like, you know, everybody can make a different set of strings. So it doesn't, wouldn't really make sense. So I think I'm going to have some like cards made or something that just we'll have a code that you can like design a set on our site and get one for free. So email me. And if you find me in person, I'm not sending them out. You're going to have to come shake my hand. Ah, uh, there you go. But I will, I will be there and we can make that happen. Nice. Nice. <laughs> that, no, that's cool. <laughs> I thought it's cool. So. Yeah. Yeah. People like that. That's awesome. Okay, good. I'm glad to hear. <laughs> All right, man. Well, that's probably a pretty good, uh, good note to wrap up on. We are um, approaching the hour mark. So Sweet. before before we eclipse it, I got to do the uh, the thing. Um, shameless plugs, anything you want people to know about, anything coming up other than what you just said, uh, Nam. But uh, mm-hmm. where can everybody find you on all your various social medias, your website, etc.? Yeah, absolutely. the The big place to go is our website that will answer all your questions, and you can see uh, all the strings we offer. We do electric, bass, acoustic. Um, we have some cables and picks as well, and that is stringjoy.com, S-T-R-I-N-G-J-O-Y, it's all one word, dot com, uh, pretty easy, and Instagram is probably our biggest social network, we're, we're on Facebook and Twitter, but, you know, who cares, um, find us on Instagram, <laughs> we're at stringjoy, uh, so just at stringjoy there, uh, join the, the community, we post lots of pictures of really cool guitars, uh, and we'll always let you know there if there's a sale or anything cool like that going on. So just find us there. And as always, I'm Scott at stringjoy.com. Hit me up for anything, I guess. Let me know. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. All right, Scott. Well, it was very good talking to you. Thank oh, you for likewise, buddy. Show. Hey, it was my pleasure. Uh, mobsters, I'm not sure. Uh, that seemed like an appropriate uh, sign off to everybody. I've called them. I've called them that a few times. Okay, yeah. it seemed like it seemed appropriate to me. Uh, it is yeah. so nice to meet you all. I've been a listener myself, so it's pretty crazy to be on the other side of the curtain. Um, I'm I'm glad to be able to share some some news and insight. And as always, just let me know if there's any questions or anything else I can help with. Awesome, awesome. All right, Scott. Well, that since you listen, you know how I wrap this up. So I better do it. Go ahead, man. Uh, all right, for Scott. This is Blake, and all of you out there, good luck and good tones. Alrighty, folks, thank you very much for stopping by this week. You know I love it. Yes, I do. I love it. I love that you're listening right now. It's fantastic. Thank you so much. No, I'm not going to cry. No, I'm not. Anyway, a little. I'm going to Nam next week, which is pretty ridiculous and incredible. Um, But in that spirit, I know that I'm not going to be able to ship merch out as quickly as I would like to. So I decided that it was a good excuse to do some free shipping. So if you go to tonemob.com slash store, buy yourself that obsidian pick you've been wanting. I know you've been wanting it. You've been curious how that affects your tone. It's seriously, it's really cool. So get the get the uh, handmade obsidian pick, the Tone Mob t-shirt, 
or anything that you might happen to buy in the store. Just enter the code free ship and anything within the continental US will ship for free because I'm slow. So there you go. And to all you international folks, I do apologize. I'm already shipping at cost and it is very difficult for me to extend this offer to you. However, we may be able to work something out. Um, if you see some things you'd really like, go ahead and send an email to info at tonemob.com and we'll see if we can work a deal. I'd love to get you some sweet, sweet merch. Anyway, thanks to everyone for tuning in this week. I will report back from Nam with all of my delicious findings. You guys have yourself a good, safe week, and I will talk to you next time. Take care. One last thing before we totally sign off here, I just want to remind you that if you do any shopping at Stringjoy, that's Stringjoy Guitar Strings made in Nashville, that will help me out as well. As I've said for years, I'm heavily involved in that company, and I really do think they're making the best products on the market. So if you would like to try custom strings, go to ToneMob.com Stringjoy and check them out today. I seriously, seriously, seriously love what the team down there is doing. I help them out with all kinds of things, and by you supporting them, you are also supporting me as well. And hey, you need some strings, so why not get some custom strings just for your guitar and playing style? Again, the link for that is tonemob.com stringjoy, and that will take you right to their website, and you can do all your shopping through there, and that will help everyone involved out. So thank you very much. Talk to you next time. We are brought to you by the wonderful folks at Gun Street Wiring Shop. Yes, Gun Street Wiring Shop. I've talked about them before. I used to say based out of Bend, Oregon, but guess what? Sean moved to my neck of the woods. Sean's in Portland. Sean is awesome and has helped me with a bunch of stuff lately. And if you have wiring needs for your guitar, he can help you too. If you want to get weird with it, he can get weird. If you just need to spruce things up a little bit, there's your guy. He takes all the guesswork out of doing your guitar wiring, and he makes it simple, and his customer service is top-notch, and I can't say enough good things about Gunstory as a company. I really respect Sean and what he's all about, and the product is top-notch. I've got three different guitars that now have Gunstreet harnesses in them, and I could not be happier. So go to GunstreetWiringShop.com and check them out.